Welcome to the fourth edition of the EAG talk organized as part of the Kendrim Academy. The Kendrim Academy is our effort to provide no learning knowledge about ESG to our audience. The Academy will be very soon enriched with the 10th module about climate. And this is very appropriate that today our focus will be on climate. I'm thrilled to have with me today Jean-Marc Jancovici. Jean-Marc Jancovici is a professor at the engineering school uh, Mean Paris Tech. He's co-founder and partner at consulting firm and data firm Carbon4. Jean-Marc is also the founder and president of the NGO, The Shift Project, that is uh, providing solutions to help us uh, go to a carbon neutral future. And he is the author of many books on climate change, one of them having been translated in English. The others are available in French. Jean-Yves Wilmot. Jean-Yves is an engineer. He is the leading uh, leader on the, 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 for the finance practice within Carbon4. And in particular, he's responsible for the development of the climate methodology within Carbon4. He's also a member of the technical expert group set up by the European Commission on Sustainable Finance. So welcome to both of you. Uh, Today, we'd like to use this opportunity to provide a bit more in-depth knowledge on climate, the role that companies can play in helping Europe becoming a, a carbon neutral subcontinent. So I suggest that we start with you, Jean-Marc, with some questions helping our audience to understand the context, and then we will go into a more tangible um, aspects relating to companies and uh, how investors can measure the impacts on, on climate. So my first question will be, the EU has set itself the ambitions to become carbon neutral by 2050. Um, could you please explain to us what does it mean concretely to be carbon neutral for a, for a continent like Europe? And also related to that, the role fossil energy plays in Europe. This is obviously one of the main sources of CO2. Uh, we probably will need to get rid of a lot of it if we want to become carbon neutral. Is it at all possible? Is it feasible? What's your view on that? So let's begin with the first question. Uh, becoming carbon neutral uh, in physical terms means uh, that you balance the emissions uh, with uh, the uptake of what is called or what uh, are called sinks. Uh, sinks are mostly the ocean and terrestrial sinks. Uh, obviously, when Europe speaks for itself, uh, oceans are not included. So becoming carbon neutral for Europe means that all the domestic sources of greenhouse gases uh, are balanced with all the domestic sinks, and uh, namely forests and uh, agricultural soils that would take back the CO2 uh, which is in the atmosphere. One of the things that the audience has to know is that CO2 as long as it is within the atmosphere, in the air, is eternal. There is no chemical process that can remove CO2 from the atmosphere because CO2 is an oxide and all oxides on Earth are very stable molecules. There is one very stable oxide that you use every day, which is water. <laughs> water is an oxide of hydrogen and it has remained under the form of water for 4 billion years. So oxides are very stable molecules, and as long as the CO2 is in, within the air, inside the atmosphere, it cannot be removed. It has to go back in contact with the surface to be removed. It's a very slow process, uh, and uh, so you, you, you cannot dream of emitting as much as today and having the CO2 vanishing into the air. It just cannot happen. Uh, the link with fossil fuels is that most of the CO2 emissions are associated with burning fossil fuels. So basically, burning a fossil fuel is oxidizing carbon. Uh, within a fossil fuel, you have plenty of carbon. A fossil fuel is a fuel, so it burns, and it is a fossil. So it's uh, remains of ancient life. Uh, coal is remains of ancient ferns uh, that lived uh, 300 million years ago, carbon, carbonifera. And uh, oil and gas are remains of ancient algae and plankton that lived uh, whenever between uh, 50 million years and 400 million years, say. So uh, when you oxidize this carbon, you release energy, which is why we do it. Uh, and that energy actually powers machines. And the important thing to know is that today we live in a civilization of machines. Your shirt has been manufactured by machines. Your mic has been manufactured by machines. Your shoes has been manufactured by machines. Tonight you will eat something that has been 
manufactured or rather planted, um, gathered, transformed, transported by machines, packed by machines. So we live in a world of machines and energy is the food of machines. And that food of machine is essentially fossil fuels. And the industrial revolution consisted in adding on top of renewable energies that were the only ones we used uh, 200 years ago and before. On top of these energies, we have added up fossil fuels, enabling to build a kind of Iron Man costume, <laughs> a very powerful Iron Man costume, uh, made of machines that work for us. So getting rid of all these machines while keeping the same economy that we have today is something that I don't believe possible. I think you mentioned in the past, in another video I saw, the equivalent in number of people that yeah. would be needed if we were to replace machines by people. Uh, on, on, uh, roughly in the world, uh, you can multiply by 200. So it, basically, if we didn't have machines to have the same production as today, so the same GDP, you would need the, 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 the human population to be multiplied by 200. That, of course, you couldn't feed. Uh, so put it another way around, it means that because we have machines, the, GDP, the world GDP is, let's say, 100 times higher what it would be if we had only our arms and legs. So energy is at the root of, of all we do every day, uh, all the time, uh, and becoming carbon neutral, that is getting rid of all fossil fuels, while keeping the same GDP and the same size of the economy is something I don't believe in. I just don't believe it's physically possible. So becoming calm and neutral is not something that we are going to do in the blink of an eye. <laughs> it is going to be very, very difficult. And if I may add, uh, last year, so 2020, uh, the world GHG emissions decreased by roughly 5%. If we want to become calm and neutral, by the end, uh, well, let's say in the second half of the 21st century, we do have to decrease the world emissions by roughly 5% each year. So it means that the, 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 the magnitude of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the action that we have to take is roughly adding an extra COVID each year. That, that's roughly what, what we, people have to keep in mind. Uh, again, I don't believe it's compatible with an ever-growing uh, economy, which will not happen anyway, because we're on a finite planet. Uh, and Becoming carbon neutral is really something which is uh, a revolution. It's just not something marginal uh, that the ESG people within companies are going to do <laughs> while the company is still doing about the same business than yesterday. Thank you. Um, you talked about the exoskeleton that machines have allowed us to build and a lot of that depends on fossil energy. Um, how much of, uh, of that exoskeleton depends on it in percentage in terms of uh, primary energy consumption? Uh, roughly 80%. Uh, the breakdown of the energy consumption today is roughly 80% fossil fuels. And within that 80%, uh, you have roughly 30-something, uh, 43, I think, for oil, uh, 25 for gas, uh, and 30 for uh, coal, in rough figures, 28 for coal. Uh, and the 20% uh, that remain are half biomass, and the other half is hydroelectricity, nuclear, and modern renewables. So you're meaning that the solar and wind today represent how Wind much? is roughly 1%. Uh, solar is roughly a little bit less than 1% in primary energy equivalent. And wind is about 2-something percent. I think it's very important to highlight this because people sometimes have the impression that because we what see all these wind turbines today in France and other countries, no, means it, that we are getting all of energy it from is the still, wind. Unfortunately, it is still marginal. And it will remain marginal for, well, in, in an industrial civilization for a very good reason, which is that air is something which is not very dense. We have mastered the harnessing the energy of air for a very long time. I mean, windmills existed 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, modern techniques are better than uh, the old wings that we had uh, with linen and whatever. But anyway, it's something that we have known for a very long time. And water mills, we have known them for a very long time. So uh, today we do better. Uh, in technical terms, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the order of magnitude by a factor 100. Uh, so today, uh, solar panels on Earth, yes, it's a little bit less than 1% uh, of our overall energy, not only electricity, and uh, windmills is 2%. Uh, hydroelectricity is 5 So uh, the main source of renewable electricity today remains dams. And actually, every time you see an article on renewable energy, uh, sorry, renewable electricity on a paper, the illustration should be that of a dam and not that of a windmill or of a solar panel. It should be that.
Um, now, you say it's going to be difficult. We need to decrease our uh, CO2 emissions by 5% every year by two, until 2050 to become carbon neutral. Um, you seem to imply that doing that whilst keeping our economy growing is very difficult. I, I, I say even worse than that. I say uh, one day or another the economy will stop growing. Uh, you see, in classical economics, uh, that I have learned at school, and probably many people that listen to us have learned the same. Uh, you consider that uh, the production factors that you look at are actually the limiting factors of the production system. When the classical economy has been designed two centuries ago, the only limiting factors in a world that was, on, on first approximation, infinite, were human beings and the human capital already accumulated, and namely uh, uh, soil that you could, that, uh, on which you could grow crops. Uh, today, actually, you have excess of work. You have unemployment everywhere. <laughs> you have excess of capital. Uh, I mean, the production capacities are not fully used uh, nowhere, uh, and you have plenty of money that you don't know what to do with. Uh, what is today the limiting factor of the economy is the natural resources that are required to produce anything and the energy which, which is required to feed the machines that transform the natural resources. Those are the true limiting factors today and not the number of people able to work. Uh, but it is not in the economic equations. Uh, so you still believe, uh, everybody still believes that uh, growth comes from mass and then as we are richer we use more energy but it's not the way it's physically operating. The way it is physically behaving is that first we have energy, then we are able to feed machines, then we have production, and then we count it as GDP. So if you have less energy, you will have a decreasing fleet of machines. And as human beings almost don't exist in the production because it's done by machines for most of it, uh, you will have a decreasing production. And it's already happening in Europe, actually, uh, since 2008. Why 2008? Because, not because of Lehman Brothers, because in 2008, the conventional oil production peaked on Earth. There is a report from the International Energy Agency that states that uh, issued in 2018, uh, saying that uh, all that is not shale oil and tar sands peaked in 2008. Uh, and shale oil and tar sands either peaked in 2018 or will peak in the coming years. So once oil decreases, transportation decreases, and so the economy will, will have a hard time growing again. Uh, and so even if we don't want to become carbon neutral, at some point the economy will contract because we will have less energy to power the machines. Uh, the, the, I would say the limit uh, is more or less remote depending on the type of energy that we look at, but for the last 40 years, among all the energies that we use, the, the, the first limiting one was oil. You have a perfect adjustment for the last 40 years on the evolution of the world GDP and the evolution of the world oil production in barrels, not in dollars, don't, mm. don't care about dollars, in barrels. And yet, since 1990, uh, the Europe has decreased its CO2 emissions by 20% and the economy has kept growing. So where is the explanation here? The, the explanation is that part of the growth is a false growth it's your growth, actually. Uh, it's inflation of assets. <laughs> so it's not a true growth. Uh, if, you have, uh, if the real estate prices, for example, increase, then uh, when people uh, have mortgages for the same surface, the mortgages increase. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the production of credit fashionably increases. Uh, so you, you, you can say that you have more GDP because of that. Uh, the, the, when the price of stocks increase, all the people in the financial sector have um, growing turnovers, but you have not more stock, you just have higher prices. So if you look at the true production, actually in Europe it has been decreasing since 2007. For example, construction has decreased since 2007. Uh, truck transportation has decreased in volume. Uh, the industrial production uh, is at the same level or a little lower if you aggregate uh, all Europe. So uh, you don't have growth anymore in Europe since 2008. It's, physically speaking, mm -hmm. it's only because of the conventions that you use that the GDP seems to keep on growing. Now, from the investor standpoint, we are, as you just mentioned here, amongst the mostly investors. 
So what is, in your view, uh, the role of investors in um, enabling uh, what needs to be done or what can be done to uh, fulfill the objectives of the EU? The, I would say there are things that you can do, things that you have to do, but you won't do them joyfully. <laughs> uh, the first thing that you can do is understand what is at stake. Uh, today, my belief is that uh, in the economy at large, uh, and particularly in the financial sector, uh, the understanding of the issue at stake remains uh, too low mm -hmm. for people to address correctly the issue. So if I'm precise, uh, my belief is that uh, it takes 20 to 30 hours uh, of courses to properly understand what is at stake, uh, understand what is climate change exactly, understand what is the role of energy in framing the economy exactly, what it means if we have more or less oil, etc. Uh, you need about the same volume to understand what are the metrics that Jean-Yves will talk about uh, to address the issue uh, when you are within, when you have to do things in practical terms, uh, are all the, met the methods equivalent? Uh, does it mean something to be neutral or you sh just shouldn't use that word, etc.? So you, you, you need to learn the grammar, I, I, I could say. Uh, and then you have to deploy metrics in all the operations because uh, carbon is not in euros or not in dollars. Uh, th there is absolutely no link between the monetary value of operations and the carbon content of operations. So if you want to understand what you're doing regarding the climate issue, you need a separate accounting in which you need to invest about the same means that you invest in monetary accounting. You mean physical flux, uh, flows? Yes, physical flows. You have to understand what it, what it means. So you have to understand for every company and every state uh, what are the transition risks coming from where, what are the physical risks coming from where, and from there, what are your bets uh, on what could happen in the future. And that takes, it, you, you, need, you need other pairs of glasses to do that. Uh, you cannot do that with monetary, uh, monetary accounting. And uh, another way to put it is that uh, the, the physics of tomorrow will give you a better prediction of the euros of tomorrow then the euros of the past will give you a good prediction of the euros of tomorrow. To understand the physical flows, uh, especially related to CO2, to better understand the creation of values by companies in the future. What so. can thrive, what will suffer, and why. Uh, and you also better understand the systemic effects. Uh, I'm going to take a very, uh, a very simple example. Suppose uh, you have a delivery company. Uh, people that work within the company, uh, they all use bicycles. <laughs> uh, and what they deliver is uh, meals made only with vegetables uh, grown uh, in your garden. So I'd say this is perfectly low carbon. Okay? But now just assume that the only client of that company uh, is an airline company. <laughs> Do you think that you are away from transition risks? Obviously, no. <laughs> So the, the metrics that you use, they have to be uh, adapted to the problem that you address. And a transition risk is not something that you may necessarily uh, be able to act on in the short term. So the, the understanding all this, so understanding the issue and understanding all the way to address the, the issue is something that requires uh, time and money. Uh, and a way to summarize it, in my view, is that uh, any company in the financial sector that is not devoting to understanding and training the people and, and spreading the metrics, let's say 5% of the IT budget is not serious. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you, you speak to uh, a number of CEOs of large French and other companies. You spoke to uh, a panel with a member of the European Commission recently. You see, speak to all these people. Are they not understanding that? We have TCFD now that's supposed no. to provide a framework for companies to measure what you are just describing now. The, 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 the commissioner that you mentioned, uh, that you just mentioned, is the commissioner for justice. Mm. Uh, I'm sure he believes, he deeply believes, that he's fully away from the problem. <laughs> that it's something that you can delegate to some, a couple of, of, of engineers uh, and ask them to do their stuff uh, in, their, in their field. And, no, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, for example. Do you, what proportion of the population knows that forever it will, be, it will not be possible to remove the excess CO2 that we have put in the atmosphere? 
you, you remove the CO2? I mean, Fully removing the, CO, oh. the excess CO2 that we have put mm -hmm. in the atmosphere for the last two centuries okay. is just something that will not happen, never, ever, mm -hmm. for the rest of historical mm -hmm. times. Who has understood that? I don't know. It's a good question. A very small fraction of the population. Do you I think most you. people think that carbon capture and storage is a viable solution? Most to people remove? think that the day we decide to act, mm -hmm. the situation is fully reversible. Mm -hmm. Something which, which is not. Uh, what fraction of the population knows that a four degree increase is the equivalent of going from an ice age to the world that we know today? I, I'm, I'm not sure that many people know that. Mm. Who has understood that such an increase in temperature uh, over a century basically means hunger, riots and wars everywhere? I'm not sure that a significant fraction of the population has understood that. So no, I, I do believe uh, that today the understanding of the issue at stake remains too, too, too low, much too low, for people uh, to take action <coughs> at the right level. Something you also uh, often mention is the fact that, and you just alluded to it now, that addressing climate change is not just a, a question of getting a bunch of very smart engineers uh, in the US, in the Silicon Valley of elsewhere, to come up with great solutions to capture, store CO2 and make solar panels five times more efficient and so on. First, you have physical realities that bump against that, but also um, that it it's goes beyond that. This is a, a, a collective uh, transition, not just an energy transition in a way. For the, we, we, we have had technical improvements uh, since the apparition of humanity. And since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have had plenty of technical improvements everywhere. None of these improvements has um, prevented the emissions from growing <laughs> for the last century and a half. So it means that finding something new, something technically new, does not guarantee that we are going to decrease emissions. Because in the past, it was not the case. The cars that can be uh, bought today are far more efficient than the cars that could be bought 50 years ago. But they are bigger, unfortunately. But you have many more cars. Mm. They are heavier. They go faster. They have bigger engines. And at the end of the day, the, the amount of oil which is consumed today by all the cars in the world is much over what it was 50 years ago. I'm going to take the, uh, an another example, which is uh, the digital. Uh, the first computer that was manufactured by men, the ENIAC, uh, 40, 1945 or 46, I don't remember, uh, had a power intake of 150 kilowatts. 150 kilowatts. The tablet that you are using right now has a power intake which is probably 10 watts, 20 watts. So you can see uh, the tremendous increase and it, and it can compute far faster than the ENIAC. Uh, so you can see the tremendous increase uh, regarding the energy efficiency of a, unical, of, of, of a logical unit, sorry. Uh, the, the power intake of a logical unit has been decreased by something like 10 millions <laughs> over 50 years. The overall electricity consumption of the fleet of computers on Earth, <laughs> that was one computer in 1945, uh, has been multiplied by, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands. I mean, today the electricity consumption of the digital is 10 to 20 percent of the overall electricity consumption on Earth. Whereas when we had only one computer, even if it was a big computer, it was just negligible. So uh, improving things uh, on a unitary basis doesn't guarantee success at all. Uh, unfortunately, if we want to tackle the issue, we'll have to set overall limits, which basically we don't like. We don't like the idea of having overall limits that we do have on Earth because the surface of the Earth hasn't in increased for the last two centuries, still the same. Uh, but we, it's, it's, we, we all have to do that. So uh, technical fixes won't do the job. They can help if they are, uh, I would say, if, 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 they, if they fit into a proper frame. Uh, but just saying engineers will find something is just jumping, it's just like jumping from a plane and believing that you will need a parachute before you hit the ground. Mm. I forgot to mention that the audience can ask questions and we have one here that I will read to you. Um, what if we have better renewable technologies and storage to replace fossil fuel energy sources 
This would enable to power machines in a clean way to increase production and reduce carbon emissions. I mean, just if I can uh, elaborate on that, is, uh, is there a way to power Europe using purely renewable energy? Uh, the answer is yes, we have done it for uh, all the time of Europe up to 200 years ago. So yes, we can do it. Can we do it with uh, one car per person? Uh, 40, uh, 40 square meters of uh, habitable space by person, uh, toothbrush, uh, shoes, etc. No. <laughs> so the same level of consumption that we have today, only with renewables, I don't believe a single second that we can get there. Because we can't produce enough solar panels because of, and Because of the orders of magnitude. Uh, as I said, uh, wind, the energy of wind is something which is not dense. Air is something which is not dense. Uh, so uh, uh, a cubic meter of air moving uh, at a certain speed carries very little energy. Uh, to, take, to give you an example, if you take a, cubic meet, uh, uh, a cube sorry, of 1,000 cubic meters, mm -hmm. so it's a room that would be 10 meters by 10 meters by 10 meters. And uh, if that air moves at 80 kilometers per hour, which is 45 miles per hour, uh, roughly, through a windmill, you will get the same amount of energy than, uh, than through burning three milliliters of oil. Just three milliliters, that, that size, that size. Of course, it's much easier to extract that from the ground <laughs> than building a windmill, having the, woe, the wind blowing through it. And, and uh, in that system, uh, you, can, you, can, you can lit your, your, your lamp only when there is wind. So if you want to lit it when there is not wind, you should add storage. This is very consuming in terms of metal. Uh, for example, the ratio of metal consumed per kilowatt hour between centralized power generation, coal, nuclear, gas, whatever, and uh, decentralized, in quotes, uh, is about one to 100. So you need much more metal. Uh, it is much more complicated to address uh, because the, the, you will never be able to store that on batteries. You do not have enough metal on Earth. Well, so, so it, I mean, when you look at the orders of magnitude, you will be dead by the time <laughs> we, we get there. Uh, when you look at the richest country in Europe, which is Germany, it has invested hundreds of billions of euros just to turn to renewables 30% of its electricity production, 30 to 40%. It is one country. Uh, it has not allowed to decrease uh, the dispatchable capacity that also exists in Germany. It had a, uh, Germany had 100 gigawatts of dispatchable capacity 2002. You mean dispatchable? What do you mean? The one that you can, that you can use when you turn I, the battery manageable, on. Like manageable, like fossil based and nuclear. Exactly, fossil based, uh, hydro, uh, yeah. nuclear, um, basically. So gas, gas, coal, nuclear, hydro. They had 100 gigawatts in 2002, and they have 100 gigawatts today <laughs> of dispatchable capacity, the same. And on top of that, they added renewables. So it's, it's, the, it's the demonstration that you just cannot remove the ancient system and replace it by renewables. All you can do is add on and save fossil fuel when, the, when there is wind, but, but you, you, you cannot fully remove. Uh, and when you look at the CO2 content of a solar panel plus a battery, it goes up to roughly 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is better than gas, but not zero. And no energy is zero. Right? Hydro and nuclear are at six, not 100. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's roughly the, the, uh, 20 times less. So the, the, the idea that we will go 100% renewable and keep the same standard of living is something that doesn't match physically. And to end with this, the illusion comes from the fact that uh, we compare uh, things that are not comparable. Uh, you cannot compare a kilowatt hour coming from a windmill or solar panel that produce when the external elements decide so, and a kilowatt hour coming from an installation where there is electricity when you have decided that it is so. Because we have built all our society on uh, schedules that we respect. For example, this webinar began at uh, 2.30 in France, and you didn't say it's going to be 2.30, there is not enough wind, mm -hmm. so it's 2.30. <laughs> uh, and all our society is organized this way. The bank opens at 9, doesn't say we open at 9, provided there is wind. <laughs> and your kids go to school at 9 or at 8, they don't go to school, provided there is wind. 
So if we accept the fact that there is no schedule anywhere uh, that we respect, we can go back to this kind of system, but it's not going to be the same production. If we still want to be in a society where we respect schedules, we have to take in, into account the cost of storage if we can store. And if there is a physical limitation on storage, then we just can't go to that system. Let's go back, if you, if you don't mind, to uh, the point of view of the investor who has to decide today. Some investor would really like to finance the, the best solution to enable uh, the energy transition or the, the overall transition towards a low carbon economy. And there are various options. They could finance uh, hydrogen, they could finance uh, uh, renewable uh, power generation, uh, some investments in green steel and so on. From your point of view, what's the lowest hanging fruit for an investor wanting to do something uh, positive? Work with uh, Jean-Yves. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that speaks for itself. No, no, but it's exactly what we do at Carbon4. Uh, it's trying to answer this kind of question. So in order to make all these activities comparable one to the other uh, from the investor standpoint, we have developed a number of metrics uh, that precisely allow to answer this kind of question. So the metrics that we have developed is uh, that um, what is the carbon footprint of the activity overall the value chain. Mm -hmm. For example, if you manufacture steel, it's not the same thing to sell the steel to refurbish buildings and to sell the steel to build cars that will add on top of the existing car fleet. Okay, so you, you, you have to look over the whole value chain. Uh, we look at uh, how much you can do good to the others. Uh, so, for example, if you sell insulation material, uh, you're better off uh, in a world that has to decrease its emissions than uh, if you sell extra smartphones. Uh, then you have to look uh, at the transition risk, as I explained before. So you can do good, but still have a transition risk because you're in a larger system uh, that you depend on. Uh, you must look at the fact that you will still be able to operate, even if you do good to the others, in a changing climate. Mm -hmm. And once you have looked at all this for all the possible investments, all the possible options, then you decide, which is why I've just explained before that it is something that you cannot do in a blink of an eye uh, or just like this. Uh, you have to implement and deploy uh, tools and you have to systematically call on these tools before making a decision. So it is a new process that you should, and it's not a marginal process. It should be built in uh, any decision that you make. There's a, if I understand you correctly, there's a question. So there is no low hanging fruit to, under, yeah. to answer the question. Yeah. I'm not going to say, uh, okay, if you invest into people that manufacture uh, green shirts made of cotton, you're sure to win. No. <laughs> I, I'm afraid you led me on a, on a question I hadn't planned of asking, but since we have Jean-Yves here and we discussed it in the previous talk, is the EU taxonomy. Do you think it's going in that direction of defining what's the activity that we should finance? In spite of the fact that Jean-Yves did his best, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a little disappointed with the EU taxonomy because I believe that uh, we missed the point. Uh, if you invest into an electric car in Poland, the EU taxonomy will say that it is a good thing for the climate. Mm. But for the climate, it is a better thing to invest in a small diesel car in Poland than in a big electric car in Poland. Say that you invest in a windmill. The taxonomy will tell you that it is a good thing. But if you invest in a windmill in Germany, that in addition with gas, provided the US let the Germans build Nord Stream 2, which is something that can, we can discuss another day. Uh, so if you replace a nuclear power plant by windmills plus gas, the taxonomy will tell you that you're doing a good job and the emissions will tell you that you're doing a bad job. So uh, naming an object is not naming a solution. Uh, the taxonomy should have done something else, in my view, which is it is green, Every time after the investment, the emissions are lower than before the investment. You just need that definition. The additionality, you mean? Yes. And uh, then you need, again, to install something which is costly uh, and which is painful, which is an additional accounting, which allows to decide uh, investment by investment whether it is on the good side or on the bad side. But uh, as you have probably noticed, most of the people that were members of the TEG were people coming from within the financial industry, 
So they done what was the most convenient for them, <laughs> uh, not what was the, the, the best way to answer the question. Thank you. And if you manufacture tables like this one, you'll know where the taxonomy. Mm -hmm. yes, so, if you, so if you're an investor and you want to invest into IKEA, is IKEA on the good side or on the bad side? You have no answer because they're nowhere in the taxonomy. But the taxonomy today only covers two of the six environmental objectives. Once they cover the other four, and you will have biodiversity and waste management, IKEA will be but covered as well. We are able at Carbon4 to rate IKEA on, uh, the on the climate aspect. We are able to do so because they have to manufacture their furniture, because uh, their clients have to go to the stores, uh, because trucks have to go around, etc. So we can calculate a carbon footprint and we can say whether in a world where the emissions have to decrease they are going to suffer or they are going to benefit we can say that so we can provide help to the investor uh, to, to say uh, what are the stakes of IKEA being a good or a bad investment the taxonomy doesn't give you any answer and for it the taxonomy gives you an answer for only a small fraction of the economy so it is in my view not the appropriate way because so you think object instead of thinking action. A small fraction of the economy, but not a small fraction of the CO2 emissions at the European level. It is a small fraction of the economy, and that's all that counts for investors. <laughs> okay? Mm. It's all that counts for investors. Uh, and it is not true. Uh, you can perfectly well keep your coal power plants and put Wilmans on top. I mean, I've got one of my friends who, who, who one day made that joke that I love. Say you drink a bottle of whiskey per week and you go to a diet where you drink two bottles of whiskey per week plus one bottle of orange juice. Obviously, the share of healthy drinks has increased. <laughs> okay? so, uh, and the taxonomy will tell you that you're heading in the right direction mm. because you have increased the investment into good things. And obviously, it's not the case. So the taxonomy is not a proper answer uh, to the problem uh, and it's a real issue because when you're in a race against the clock which is the case for climate change losing time is the worst thing you can do thank you i suggest we turn to jean-yves i'm sorry jean-yves you didn't do such a good job with the taxonomy <laughs> let's try to redeem you with uh, i was you... on the ben benchmark uh, subgroup of okay the and your benchmark is uh, is more the solid benchmark is, uh, better <laughs> better work maybe thanks to jean-yves <laughs> <laughs> uh, well I, with you, Jean-Yves, it would be very helpful if we could discuss how, um, how you work with companies and how companies, how you can measure the impact of companies on climate change. So what are the different metrics? Um, often we hear about uh, CO2 emissions, scope one, two, three, CO, uh, avoided emissions. This is still a bit confusing. So maybe if you could just very briefly sketch the, the basic definitions we need to understand that, and then we go into further questions. Okay, so maybe uh, to start at the corporate level and then we'll go to yep. the, the portfolio level. Um, so Jean-Marc uh, developed the, the French carbon accounting uh, methodology, so you can add up also. Um, but if you are a company and you want to tackle this uh, challenge, uh, climate change, you, you need to have a st uh, first uh, diagnosis. So the, the greenhouse gases emissions you depend on to run your business. Uh, and so the carbon footprint uh, assess across the whole value chain uh, the, the emissions uh, and it is a risk analysis more than a dependency analysis. Uh, so you will look at your direct emissions, so where you, add, you have the, the emissions on your site, on your plant. So this is the scope one. If you burn uh, fossil fuels like natural gas or if you have a car fleet and you burn uh, oil. Uh, so this is the scope one. Uh, you also uh, account for the emissions linked to uh, indirect emissions linked to energy, mostly electricity. So it is the scope one of the electricity producer. This is the scope two of your, uh, your company. Uh, and the scope three is all the rest on the value chain. So the scope three upstream is what happened uh, on, the, on the upstream side. So uh, mostly your suppliers, also the business travels of uh, your, your employees, uh, the commuting of your employees, for, for example. Uh, and on the, the downstream side, you have uh, the use of sold products. And uh, I can give you an example of, of that if you have uh, a car manufacturer, uh, an automotive company, 
Uh, the scope one and scope two will be the, the energy used by the, the company, so mostly the power plants to assemble the, the cars. Uh, but of course, to, to assemble the cars, you, you need to have the, the, raw, ma the raw materials, so the, the steel, the plastics, and so on. So the extraction, the production, and the transportation of all these materials will be in the scope three upstream. And uh, on the downstream side, you will, you will have the use of the cars by the clients, so on the, on the life cycle of the cars. And of course, uh, the impact for a car manufacturer or the transition risk are less <laughs> the energy efficiency of their, uh, their plants, their factories, than to have light cars and, uh, most important uh, of all, the efficiency of the car to, to have low carbon uh, products. Uh, so that's why we, we need to assess scope one, two and three emissions, both upstream and downstream. Now, if you if we reason in terms of order of magnitude, something that uh, Jean-Marc referred to earlier, for a car manufacturer, so taking your example, how much of its total emissions would come from scope one and two and how much would come from scope three, upstream and downstream, approximately? Uh, it will be like um, five... Two to five percent for the, the scope one and two, it will be twenty percent for the for the upstream, and so uh, seventy five percent for the downstream. Meaning that if we really want to assess the the impact of one company like a car manufacturer, but I guess it applies to many others on climate. It's not just about looking at how much the company sends into the air in terms of CO two, but how much then is sent by using its products and getting the raw materials to produce its products, right? Exactly, exactly. because the day that uh, the clients cannot use the cars that are too, uh, too ca carbon intensive, the car manufacturer will not be able to sell the, those cars. So, so it is a transition risk. And uh, also, if it wants to, to have an impact on um, the, the, the climate change, so to reduce the world emissions, it has also to, to develop these low carbon cars. So, so yes, you need to, to look at the whole value chain. But do companies provide this data? Do we have it as investor to make that analysis? I mean, it's a very general question, of yeah. course. You could say for Europe, yes, for this region, no. Um, so it's mandatory, uh, to, to my knowledge, only in one country, it's France. <laughs> so, uh, with the, Thanks uh, to Jean-Marc, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, yes, don't to, to Jean-Marc. The, the fact that the carbon uh, accounting uh, was born in France, maybe, uh, led to the fact that we, we have these standards and uh, that a lot of companies has, uh, has started earlier than in other countries to, to, to uh, measure these emissions. Um, but scope one, two, three are only uh, mandatory in France. Um, but there are um, voluntary reporting frameworks um, and so on. All around, uh, all around the world, of course, you have uh, carbon reporting. Uh, but on scope one and two, I would say, all around the world for large corporates, you will have most of the time accurate data. For scope three, uh, you will have only pieces. Mm -hmm. For example, the, the, the business travels, because it's really easy to calculate that because your travel agency will do the work for you. So most of the company in the, enfin, some companies have, uh, have a scope three with only the, the travels, the business travels. And if you're not uh, knowledgeable on this subject, uh, like, like Thomas said, you, you need to understand what are in these metrics. But you see an oil and gas company which has a very small scope three. Uh, oh, it's a good company, but no, it's, not, it's only that they only report on their business travel, but not on the use of sold products, which will account for 80% of the emissions. So. To Today, when we see you're talking about oil and gas companies, and let's let's dig a bit deeper on, on this particular example. I guess it's a good one since it represents a big share of CO2 emissions. Today, uh, many, at least in Europe, oil and gas companies have announced that they would that aim to, I think, become carbon neutral by uh, 2050. Um, on the face of it, it seems a little counterintuitive. But maybe you know it's it's feasible. So could you explain how this is possible, or whether we need to put some caveat into this affirmation? Um, for for a company uh, to, to um, it's not possible to be carbon neutral now. So the the idea is how to contribute to the world carbon neutrality, and so to, the first step 
to go to, uh, to this carbon neutrality is to reduce your emissions according to, uh, to, to scenarios that, led to, that lead to, to, to the carbon neutrality. Because to, to, um, um, to count on, uh, for, for example, uh, offsetting, will not reduce the, um, the climate change uh, because not every uh, emissions today can be... Uh, 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 there is not any, uh, any, any things, um, any, uh, enough things on the world to uh, compensate all the, all the world emissions. So the idea is to go on a path that you reduce the emissions so there will be enough things in one point of time. Um, and so for a company, uh, it has to reduce the emissions accordingly to scenarios uh, with sectoral carbon budget. Uh, and problem with this natural uh, carbon neutrality uh, claims is that you have not uh, the path of reduction of these induced emissions of the carbon footprint into these claims. So they, um, there is a balance between maybe a real absolute uh, emission reduction, but also offsetting, uh, also uh, going to other, uh, other energy. So uh, for example, develop uh, renewable energies, but you, you can reduce your carbon intensity by two if you don't change anything on your energy mix, uh, fossil energy mix, but just add up uh, as much uh, renewable energy as you, as you have uh, uh, fossil fuel. So, if you have, for example, a, a target in intensity, just like the, the whiskey and the <laughs> orange juice, you don't reduce the world uh, energy emissions. And that's the problem with uh, current uh, carbon neut neutrality claims, is that you not, uh, they, they do not say what you do on the, the carbon footprint, so the, the absolute emissions, how you reduce it, uh, and how m you contribute to the sinks, to, to, to develop uh, carbon sinks to, to go to this neutrality. This all relates to one single company, and we see it's already quite a challenge to assess at one company level uh, how it's aligned to a given uh, scenario or carbon reduction scenario. If we now start combining companies to create portfolios um, and we combine scope one, two, and three, what are the challenges and how can you measure the alignment of a whole portfolio with a given, like a two degree scenario, the Paris Agreement uh, scenario? Uh, yes, good, good question when you look at the, the, the portfolio level and um, the, the idea is to measure how the companies contribute to the, the low carbon transition to the, the, the Paris Agreement. And so, um, of course, you need to have the starting point, uh, which is the, the carbon footprint, but also to look at the dynamics of the emissions. And so what we will do uh, when we analyze uh, companies to have a, a portfolio analysis is to look also at the, the, the past emissions, how the company, uh, does the company uh, already have reduced its emissions, uh, and also the future, what are the targets, uh, what are the global strategy of the company uh, related to the climate change, uh, and does the company already invest in uh, low carbon technologies and low carbon markets, uh, etc. So I think, sorry, so I interrupt you here, but I think this is very important to highlight that it's not just about looking at past emissions, which is what you find in uh, some you know, platforms giving you CO2 emissions of companies like one, two years ago. There's also the, the looking at the future or at making a, some form of assessment of the credibility of the, the company's yeah. plans, investments. Of course, the, the importance uh, today is the future, eh? and the idea is to be carbon neutral in 2050. Um, but uh, having already reduced uh, your emissions accordingly to a scenario, so uh, several percent per year, is a first proof that you are able to transform your company, to change uh, your uh, power plants, etc. Et so um, the, the past emissions add credibility to the targets, but of course the importance is the future. And now if you combine this into a portfolio, we get all these companies together. Uh, and, uh, and yes, if I may uh, just add out how you can contribute as a company. So of course, uh, you can be a high emitter and the idea is to decrease your emissions. Uh, you can also provide uh, low carbon products or services and so help the other 
and mostly uh, your, your clients to decarbonize themselves. Give you an exa example of uh, this? If you are man a manufacturer of uh, insulation materials for building, so you will have a f your footprint and you need to reduce it. But we can also assess for avoided emissions, uh, meaning you will help others to decrease their emissions and you, you have a contribution to the, the world uh, emission reduction. Okay, and now combining this into a portfolio and combining scope one, two, and three, how do you avoid the bulk counting? Uh, so, so we, we have a, <laughs> a retreatment of the emissions, uh, of course, because uh, if you have on a portfolio an oil and gas company, uh, an automotive manufacturer, and, um, and the user of the car, you will count the emissions three times for the energy production, the energy consumption, and uh, the, the manufacturing of the equipment. So uh, basically, if you look the world at the macro level, we will have three, time, uh, three times the emissions of the world. So we retreat the emissions by dividing, dividing by three uh, the emissions at portfolio level, which um, enable us to, to allocate the, the responsibility or the, uh, yes, the, the fact that three kind of macro sectors mm -hmm. need to reduce their emissions to be able to, yes, to, 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 to follow a, a, a scenario. So that is the way to, re to, to avoid the, the, the triple accounting. Uh, and then we, we have also a, a score uh, that takes into account the current performance, so the, the carbon footprint, the past performance and the future performance. And so by sector, we are able to, to uh, score the companies, and we use this score to, uh, to benchmark uh, a portfolio with uh, either the global economy, the, the current economy, which is a line uh, between three and four degrees, and uh, a two degree uh, economy. And so we are able to, to, to give a, a, a temperature to a portfolio. Okay, so you, you can calculate for a given portfolio, this is aligned to with two and a half degrees or three degrees, or Yes, with this benchmark approach, uh, yes, we are able to do so. So you compare, if I understand correctly, a given portfolio with an, uh, a fictitious portfolio that is aligned with uh, two degrees, and you assess based on how far your port the, the portfolio you want to measure is uh, how far it is from that ideal portfolio to assess its temperature, is that correct? Yes, or? exactly. Between uh, the um, 3.5 uh, benchmark and the two degree benchmark, we are able to, to, to say the portfolio is it, uh, yes, two, two, two and a half, three, yeah, two and a half, four, four degrees. Uh, so depending on um, the emissions, the current emissions, but of course the, also the future emissions, uh, because it's very, very important to, to have this forward looking approach. We've had many questions and I realized that I haven't asked many uh, or just one. But one final question for you, uh, Jean Yves, if I may, is. In terms of data, um, amongst all the companies we can invest in uh, globally, so not only in Europe, in the US, but in the emerging market as well, uh, where do we get the best data from companies and where is it today difficult to make such assessment because mm -hmm. of the lack of data? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Scope 3 is not well reported by companies. Uh, scope one and two only for large uh, la large companies, uh, and so the idea, if you want to have uh, a data that you can work with and that is comparable uh, between company within one sector, that you, today you don't have uh, any other choice than to recalculate yourself or with a, <laughs> a data provider that do it for for you. So that's what we do at Carbon Four, uh, actually at Carbon Four Finance, which is the data provider side of, of Carbon Four. And in fact, what uh, they do, they use the expertise of Carbon4 that works with uh, all sectors of the economy and uh, that develop the methodology, so, so Carbon Impact analytic, Analytics, um, that say for each sector how to recalculate scope 1, 2 and 3 emissions based on physical data, so tons, uh, kilowatt hour, kilometers, etc. Um, and so we know which are the the emission source that are uh, significant for each sector and how to, to calculate it. Okay. Uh, and so that is, uh, to, according to, to me, the, the only way to have a comparable data is to, to recalculate. And uh, we have this particular uh, bottom-up approach, meaning we really go into detail of the, the different uh, activities of a company 
We calculate this activity data, and we are able uh, to recalculate comparable scope three, of course, scope one and two, uh, but also scope threes. Uh, and, and so the idea is to be able to, to select uh, companies uh, with uh, consistent data. Uh, and so that's what uh, Carbon4 provides. Thank you. We have five minutes left, so I will throw a few questions at you. If you can give short answer, we cover more, otherwise it will be just one or two. Uh, maybe for you, Jean-Yves, or if you want to jump in as well, how do you look at emission reduction targets at the portfolio level? Is there a method according to you? Um, so, so we provide, uh, so according to me, it's, uh, I will refer to my clients, there we, we provide different metrics, so the carbon footprints at the portfolio level. Um, we have also the carbon impact ratio, which are the, the emission savings divided by the uh, the, 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 the carbon footprint, uh, also a global score, and, uh, and also the temperature. So all these indicators can be used to set targets, uh, and we have seen different uh, strategies uh, with, uh, with our clients. So this, uh, but these metrics are designed to, to be able to, to pilot these uh, strategies and to define targets. Um, and also, uh, SBTs are, uh, have also developed. Uh, so, science-based target yeah, science initiative uh, is working on a methodology for uh, financial sectors, but it is based on uh, data and that takes into account the starting point and the target. So, so it won't give you the um, uh, the data; it's just how to use it. So, it's kind of uh, in line with with uh, what we do. Now, I think it's one for you. Uh, why would it be impossible to come up with a technical solution to remove excess CO2 from the atmosphere? There is a very efficient solution for that, which is called trees. <laughs> I'm going to give you an order of magnitude. Uh, the, the sun sends to the Earth each year 10,000 times the energy that we use. Per year or per, per year? Per year, 10,000 times. About one-third of that energy is reflected to space. So Earth keeps 7,000 times the energy used by men. Uh, about one-third falls on continents. Uh, so one-third of 7,000, let's say it's 2,000. About one-fourth of the continents is occupied by forests. So we go down to 500 times the energy used by humans. Photosynthesis uses a small 1% of that uh, solar energy, which still makes four to five times the energy used by men. So if we had a technical device used to remove a chemically inert molecule present in the atmosphere at the concentration of 0.04%, it would take four to five times the energy that humanity is using. Full stop. <laughs> so it will never happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's clear. Uh, maybe another question for you, Jean-Marc, if I may. Right, it will never happen at the, at the good magnitude. I mean, yeah. so uh, uh, a couple of people can make the buzz and invest in uh, something, and that will, uh, it, it, it will be, it will enable to write a couple articles in the paper saying, look at this, it's fantastic. And maybe even the ministry will go and say, look at this, it's but it will not be at the scale. So we need to first reduce the quantity of CO2 emitted before we can even think of removing it. We will not remove CO2 at large scale in the atmosphere. The only thing we can do is grow trees, uh, basically. Uh, it's, not the th it's not what we are doing right now since we are chopping down forests. Mm. Um, maybe one uh, probably final question for you, uh, Jean-Marc. And I'm afraid this <laughs> it's, a, it's a little personal one, um, but I'll try it anyway. Where do you invest your money? Uh, in carbon four. <laughs> Apart from carbon mm. four, I have no stocks, no bonds. For what reason? Because I, I, I never understood anything in finance. So the only company if, in which I have trust is carbon four. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a perfect conclusion for, uh, for, for this talk. <laughs> Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, uh, you can uh, rewatch this talk uh, online once it will be available. And don't forget to check the new module in the Candrium Academy on climate, where you will find many of the information that uh, Jean-Marc and Jean-Yves have discussed today with some charts and data to just review uh, uh, the basics.
Thanks for watching and until next time. Thank you.